What's going on everybody? Welcome back to the video. Today, we're gonna to be taking a look at Glue and Glue Data Brew in AWS. Now within the Glue umbrella, which includes Glue Data Brew, it's mostly for building pipelines and creating ETL processes. This is how you get data from one place to another. You can extract data, transform data, load the data, and do a ton of other things with it. So in this video, we're gonna take a look at both Glue and Glue Data Brew because they're slightly different and they have different purposes. So without further ado, let's jump on my screen and take a look. All right, let's go down here. We're gonna go down to Analytics. Now we're gonna be taking a look at both AWS Glue Data Brew and AWS Glue. Now we're gonna start with Data Brew because I think it's a little bit more user friendly. There's some nice animations. The UI is really uh, a little bit, I would say, easier to understand. And this is often a place where you'll come for a lot of your transformations. So let's come in here. And you can go ahead and take a look at a lot of stuff in here. On this right hand side, we have data sets, projects, recipes, uh, jobs, and we'll take a look at a few of those while we're in here. And you can look at some of the benefits as well. And uh, Glue Data Brew is awesome. It's very much a more visual way to prepare your data and even says it's a visual data preparation tool. And so it's a way to visualize how your data is changing. And you can see how it's changing. We are not gonna just create a project, we're gonna create a sample project. And this is gonna give us some sample data. We're gonna work with it, we're going to be cleaning it up, transforming it a little bit, and then we'll see how we can automate that as well. So let's go ahead and create our sample project. Let's go ahead and select popular baby names in 2020. And then we have to go down here and choose a role name. Now, we haven't talked a lot about IAM roles uh, within AWS, but for certain things like Glue, DataBrew, Glue, and a few other things, you need IAM access. So you can say create new IAM role, and that's what we're gonna do. Let's go down here. And we need to actually create um, a new role for AWS Glue Brew service. So it's going to create it, and I'll explain that in just a little bit. We'll call this one Alex the Analyst, and I'll call it DataBrew. Let's go ahead and create this project. Now this needs to set up our session. It's provisioning some compute and getting our session ready, getting our data ready, all of these things in order to use DataBrew. But while we're in here and while we're waiting for this to uh, be ready, I wanna talk a little bit about the UI. So over here, we have something called a recipe. Now the recipe is for when we actually use all of these things and we apply different changes to the data set. We make any transformations, whether we join the data, we group the data, we pivot the data. It's gonna say, okay, you did this and then this and then this and then this, and you can come in here and you can edit this. And so you can say, oh, I don't wanna actually group it. Let me get rid of that. And that'll be really easy to do and i'll show you that in a little bit but then we can also save this recipe we can just say oh i want to save this for a future data set or if you want to use that recipe on you know if you're bringing in multiple uh, data sets of the same exact data or you have multiple uh, data sets coming in that are all the same then you may use the same recipe on all of them to transform that data consistently every single time looks like our data is done or our session is ready but let's look at this top area so this is where we can make all of our transformations we can filter we can sort we can come in here and we can click on the clean and you'll notice there are tons of different options in here a lot of ones that you should be pretty familiar with if you've ever cleaned data before or if you've ever done any of my projects in mysql or excel or tableau or uh, you know python and all these different ones on data cleaning and these are a lot of really popular things in order to clean the data so there's clean extract uh, you can look at duplicates, outliers, you can merge your data, you can perform functions, you can apply different functions to your data. We also have things like pivot, group, join, union, and others, and there's just a ton in here. Now what we're gonna do is, well, first we're gonna look at our data, and then we're gonna go through and we're gonna do a few changes to it so you can see how the recipes work, and then we'll save our recipe. So let's come in here. This is a new data set to both of us. This is our uh, baby names data. So we have count, we have gender, we have the ID, we have the name and then the year. And so this is pretty interesting information. Let's see if it's all uh, 1880. This looks like just a small sample of the data. And we can come in here and we can also uh, take a look at what kind of data types they assigned to this data as well. Now what we're gonna do is something quite simple. We just wanna look at the male names and we wanna take a look at the most popular male names per year. So that's gonna require a bit of grouping. So we're gonna have to group on both the year and the name. And then we're gonna have to filter based off of the gender. 
Now, one other thing to note is that right now we're just working with a sample of the data. When we actually get to the final process and we actually create this data cleaning process, we can apply this to the entire data set or we can apply it to the sample. So right now we're just going to be working with this sample, but we'll of course be using the full data set later on. And you can even come up here and you can look at this. You can say first n rows, last n rows and random. Now, right now we're just looking at the first n rows, the first 500 rows of our data set. And that may not be a perfect sample size. It actually may be better to pull random rows. Because what if we have uh, male or female or other things? Right now, it just looks like we have female in our sample, and that may not be representative of the entire data set. So let's come here to random rows. Let's choose 500. And we're gonna load this sample. And as you can see, we do. We do have males in here. And so I'm really glad we did that because now we kind of have a better representation of our data. And so I think what we need to do, let's bring over our recipe. I think what we need to do or what we're going to do is one, I wanna filter where the gender is equal to male. Then we're gonna come over here and we're gonna to try to find the most common name per year. Or maybe we'll just group by the year and the name and do a count on the name. I think that would be really interesting. So we're really transforming it quite a bit. So what we're gonna do is we're going to filter on this gender. So we're gonna go over here to filter. And we're going to go down to by condition. Now we want to say where gender is equal to male. So you can either do contains and we can do contains an M or we can say it is exactly. Either one of these will be perfectly fine. We're going to do that on gender right here. So we have 300 females, 200 males. We don't want the females so we can get rid of that one. We're going to only keep the males. We can also enter a value in here, uh, but we don't need to do that. And so now this is ready to go. We're gonna go down and we can either preview changes, but we're just gonna go ahead and apply this. And as you can see right here in our recipe, it says under our applied steps, we have filter values by gender. We can either edit this or we can delete this. So at any time, if we wanna change any of this, uh, we can do that. But as you can see in our preview, in our sample, we now only have 200 rows and it's all filtered by males. Now what we can do is we're going to group this data. We want to do it based off of the year and the name. So let's come up here. We're going to group and we need to select our columns. So we're going to start with the year and we're going to group by the year. And then we're going to select the name as well. And we'll come down here and we'll say group by. But we also wanted, and you'll notice, we also wanted to aggregate these values. So we want the count. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna come in here and we're gonna say, based off of the name, we wanna count of the names for that year and name. So we're gonna do a count here. And so for this new column, you can call it the name count and that'll be perfectly fine. This is uh, just like an example down here, but it shouldn't be a string. This should be an integer. And so if we come down here, let's see, there should be some that have multiple um, higher than one, at least not in our preview but still we're working on a sample here. So let's go ahead and finish this. And now we have our data right here. Now, again, this is only working off the 200 rows. We could have 100,000, 50,000 uh, in our data, but we grouped off of the year and then we grouped off of the name and then we got a count of the name. Now, what we need to do is I also wanna filter or sorry, sort on this year. And we can do that uh, just by sorting here manually. So we can come over here and it's just gonna do this within our uh, window. But I actually wanna apply a sort to here. So I wanna do this ascending, so the smallest year to the largest year. And we'll do this based off of the year. Then we'll come down here, we'll click apply. And now we have our years over here in ascending from smallest all the way down to largest. So now that we've applied all of our steps and really transform our data on our sample data set, let's go ahead and save this recipe. We're gonna go ahead and publish this. So you can add some notes if you would like. We're gonna publish this. And so now we've saved that recipe. And in fact, if we come over here to recipes, you can see that we've saved this. So we have that available. And if we go back to our projects, we can come up here and we can create this job. So we're gonna call this one the uh, name aggregator. This is the data set associated with it, and we can choose our output. So where do we want this output to be? Let's put it in S3. Uh, we can keep it right here. Let's go to our S3 location, and let's just put it in the Alex the Analyst bucket. Let's select that. 
and we have some additional options down here. So we have some advanced settings. One, the maximum number of units. So that's to do with how many nodes you want on this job when it actually runs. You can specify if it times out or how many times you want it to retry it. This one is probably the more important one is if you want to schedule this right here. So you can come in here and you can create a new schedule and you can specify, I want this recurring every, and this says one hour, but maybe you want it recurring or doing it on a specific time of the month. And you want to automate this and run this maybe every week or every month and get an output of the data that you have. So this can be really, really useful. You can add tags for permissions. We just need to specify our role and we can create and run this job. Now it's gonna take a little bit to run because it's gonna be working in a much larger data set. But in a little bit, it's gonna run this entire job. It's gonna output our CSV into our S3 bucket. And then we're gonna go and take a look at it. So let's go over here to jobs and see its status is still running. Let's wait for just a little bit and it's gonna be doing that on the entire uh, project. It's not just gonna be doing that on the sample, it's using the uh, full data set. And so let's wait for this to be done and then let's go look at our output. As you can see, it succeeded. It took about two minutes. It finished up very quickly or just a second ago. Let's come up here to our S3 bucket and it should be right in here. So let's go ahead and refresh this. And now you can see we have this new folder name aggregator. Let's click in it. And now we have all of these CSVs. Now this is to be expected because this is the default option within Glue Databrew. I personally do not like this. I want a single CSV output, as I'm sure most of you do. Let's come back up here to our jobs and let's go into this name aggregator. Let's come over here and we're gonna select edit job. And now we have right here. This is our uh, job that we just created. Now what we need to do is get rid of this. We need to go to settings because right now, for file partitioning, we have file output options, auto generate files, default file output setting that generates multiple files. This usually results in the fastest job runtime, which can be important uh, for some use cases, especially as you scale your uh, company or your business or your department. You know, these things do matter a lot, but for what we're doing, we want a single file output. We also have an option out here for our file storage where we can create a new folder for each run or replace output files for each job run. We'll keep it the create, but depending on what you're doing, uh, you may want to replace it as well. Let's go ahead and save this. Then we're gonna come down here and we're going to save it as well. And now we need to actually run this. So now we're gonna click run job and we're gonna run the same one except as a single file output. Let's go ahead and run this. Now it's going to be running. It's going to take a little bit longer than the minute 37 seconds, but hopefully not by a lot. So let's wait just a little bit and then we will see what it looks like in our S3 bucket. All right, this succeeded and somehow took less time. Uh, so AWS is just messing with us right now. They're lying to us completely. Let's go back to our bucket. We're going to come back just to the bucket. Let's go ahead and refresh this. There's our next one. I think this is the second one. Uh, they have different names, obviously, because we didn't overwrite. Let's come into here, and now we have our CSV. You can go ahead and download that. And in fact, I'm not just going to tell you to download it. I'll download it too. So let's come in here. Let's go and download this. All right, let's open this up, and let's take a look. So let's come over here. Let's filter this real quick, because there's a lot in here, I'm assuming. Let's come over. And it looks like there's only one, only most common name per year. Uh, apparently, I completely misunderstood the data. Uh, this is probably what they did was they took they told us the most common year or the most common name per year. Um, and I just wasn't thinking about it. So I think we misunderstood the assignment. Actually, you know what? I'll take the blame. I'll take the blame. I misunderstood the assignment. But we do have 25,779 rows. Uh, and so, you know, just a little example of how to use it, although I'm not an expert on that data set, so uh, I take full blame for that. But you can see the process that we took on how to clean the data, change the data, and get a correct CSV output. Let's go back over to AWS. Let's go back to our analyst bucket, and we'll stick right here for just a second. Now, one thing to note, and this is something that you may, some people may have encountered when they were trying to run this job. It's, it may say, oh, you don't have access or the ability to do that. You may have gotten an error in some way. What you may need to do, and this is something that uh, my friend Kasoon over at Analyst Builder, he helped me understand, 
is that sometimes AWS doesn't give you full functionality until you have certain services running, like an EC2 instance. Now we're not covering EC2 instances in this series, but you may need to come in here into the EC2 and you can just go to services, go make sure to go to EC2. And you may need to just launch an instance and just launch it. And what happened after I launched it was it sent me an email and said, hey, you now have full functionality for different things. It's super easy, just come in here, make sure you select your uh, pair. You can just say you don't want one and then you launch an instance and that's it. And after that, you'll hopefully within a few minutes or you know within the day, you'll get an email saying you have full functionality. You may need to do this. That's just something I wanna make mention of because I know I encountered that when I first did it. Now, I had never encountered this before because I've used it in a workplace where somebody already had all this stuff set up, right? We, this is a fully functioning production and development environment, and so I didn't have to worry about this, but this is a completely new account. And so this is a free instance. You know, you don't have to spend money on this because you get two EC2 free tier offers, and you can use those, and it should uh, be good to go. And you need to do that for what we're about to do in just a second, um, but just wanted to mention this. So that is how you can use Glue Databrew. Uh, and of course, I want you to get in here. I want you to take a look at a bunch of this other stuff. You can create rules as well for invalidating your data and you can send yourself emails uh, if you know it doesn't look good. You can come in here and look at all your data sets that you have. This is the one that we were using, the data set national baby names. And of course, you can always connect to new data sets. So if you wanna come in here, you wanna pull data out of an S3 bucket or from Redshift or you know other options within AWS, you can do that. So all really, really good stuff. Now, let's go back. We're gonna go to all services and click up here. We are gonna go all the way down to Glue. Now here's what I'll say about Glue before we even click into it. Glue Databrew is very visual. I think it's actually fairly easy to use uh, compared to Glue. Glue, I think is a little bit more complicated. Um, not entirely, but it is. Um, and so let's look at Glue really quickly. Now over on this left hand side, we have a ton of different stuff uh, and we're not going to be looking at everything in here. I'm going to look at kind of the more important things, but we have something like a data catalog and this we looked at in our lesson with Amazon Athena. They have the data catalog to set up your databases and tables and your schemas and we had crawlers. Now this is the first thing that we're going to look at within Glue because this is how you can kind of automate pulling in data, getting the data types and pulling in that data. And so it's really useful. The next is creating ETL jobs. So those are the two things that we'll be looking at in this lesson. But there's a ton of other things that it does. And so be sure to get in here and just check everything out because uh, Glue does a lot of different stuff. And I'm just not covering everything, of course, because you know, this would be a 10 hour uh, lesson. So we have a few different things. One, you can prepare your account for AWS Glue. Here's your catalog for your data sets. And then here's how you move and transform your data. And so what we're gonna do is we will need to set up roles and users. We're just not gonna do it right now, but we will need to set that up. And I'm actually gonna show you some of the IAM, uh, you know, on the back in the IAM uh, resource, how that actually looks. But let's come over here to crawlers. And we don't have any crawlers created, but we need to. Let's create a crawler. And let's create this, and we'll call this the uh, Alex the Analyst Crawler example. Let's go ahead and click next. Now we need to specify our data source. Now, just let me back up one second. You know, we want to pull in data to be able to use it in different services and we want to do it kind of automatically, like I mentioned. And so let's say we're pulling in data and we want to put it into a database or we want to pull in data and we want to put it into Athena. These are things that we can automate. And so uh, we want to specify a data source here. So let's go ahead and add a data source. We have our S3 bucket. That's what we want to do. And this is data that we used in previous lessons. So if you didn't take those lessons, be sure to go and do that. So we're gonna browse this data. Let's go into the Alex Analyst bucket. We're gonna go into patient data. We can specify single files, but let me just tell you, it won't work. Um, and you know that's just because of how the folder system works within Glue. So we need to specify the entire patient data folder. Let's go ahead and choose this. And now we have on uh, subsequent crawler runs, crawl all subfolders, subfolders only if you add new subfolders to your folder, and then based off of an event. So an event would be like something triggering and then you uh, it runs based off of that. So we're just gonna do crawl all subfolders. Let's add this data source. Let's go ahead and click next. 
Now, this is the part where we need to select an IM role. We don't have one. So let's go ahead and create a new IM role. I'm going to call this Alex Glue Crawler Role. You can call this anything. Let's go ahead and create this. And it says it successfully created it. Let's go ahead and view this. So now we're in a totally different part of AWS. This is the identity and access management. That's our IAM. So right here we created an IAM role. This is the Alex Glue. This is the Alex Glue crawler role. And then down here we have the permissions policies. So right here, this is going to be giving us access to, I believe, the S3 bucket. We can come in here and actually look at the policy. So the permissions are read and write on a specific uh, data source and that's going to be our bucket with the patient data and I think we can come up here to policy versions look right here and so this is what it looks like inside of it now this is in JSON and you can actually customize these and I'm not going to go into all how to do that but sometimes you need to depending on the data the data source if it's encrypted if it's not um, what permissions you want it to do. But what this is doing is it's allowing us to get an object and put an object in this specific resource. So that's our patient data. And that star is just a wild card to say anything in that file path. So if we go back and let's come back to this role, we also have this AWS glue service role. Now this one right here, we created when we created the crawler to specify the file path of the data set. This is AWS managed. This is one that AWS creates themselves. And we can look at all the things let me scroll down we can look at all the things that it does uh, for that aws glue service role gives us access to a ton of things for ec2 instances s3 everything within glue and we can come down here and take a look at the buckets the access to s3 as well as a bunch of other stuff and so this is what the im roles look like and you can create custom policies uh, if you want to, and you can give access to different things. And so again, we're not covering this entirely in this lesson because this is not a lesson on I am roles, but I think it is interesting and worth, uh, worth knowing. So we've created our role. Let's go down over here. Let's click next. And now we need to specify where we're going to be putting this. So we're going to put this data in our healthcare data. So this is our healthcare data again. We already had created this database back in our Amazon Athena. And we have the option to uh, create a table name prefix or choose the maximum table threshold. For the prefix, let's just say uh, crawler. There we go. And now we have this crawler schedule down here. Now you can do it on demand or you can specify whether you want a specific day of the month, whether weekly, daily, monthly, whatever you need, you can create this uh, scheduler in order to run this crawler. Let's go ahead and click next. And let's just review this real quick. This is everything that we chose. We're gonna go ahead and create our crawler. So now it says one crawler was successfully created. It's this one right here, Alex the Analyst Crawler Example. And uh, it has not run yet. So we have no crawler runs, but let's go ahead and run this crawler. So now we're going to start the crawler. It's going to start up this that we just created to pull in that patient data. And once it is completed, we're going to go take a look at it in Amazon Athena like we looked at in a previous lesson. So right down here, it says it's running. So once that's done running, we're going to take a look at that data. All right, it says that was completed. Now we can come back here to the data catalog connections. Let's go ahead and refresh this. You can see we have our crawler, that's our uh, prefix that we use, and we have patient data. This patient data and patient data two were data catalogs and part of our data catalog are tables that we created in Amazon Athena. Now let's come up here, let's just duplicate this really quickly. We're gonna go back to Amazon Athena. Let's see if it's right here. So here we go, we have Athena. And now we can access that data right here. So now if we want to, I can say, uh, let's just preview the table. It's running and we have our data in here. And so this is perfect. Um, if you remember, we had our patient data and patient data too. We manually entered that data to pull that in. 
And that was not super fun. So when we created it, we did it from an S3 uh, bucket data. But with the AWS Glue Crawler, we can do this automatically and then it'll refresh our data and we can create this uh, without having to manually do this every time we get a new data source, which let me tell you, when you start getting into a production environment or a development environment, whichever one you're in, when you have to start bringing in lots of data and the data is coming in daily or weekly or monthly, you do not want to have to manually do this. It takes up so much time. It is much better to automate this with an AWS glue crawler. So that's during that scheduling part right in here. And we come over to crawlers. We come in here. This is just on demand, but we can edit this and we come down here and we can schedule it down here if we want to. But you can also, now we have it on demand. So anytime we wanna run it, we can also just run it on demand. Um, so it's you know really, really great to have and use. So that's how we use crawlers. And crawlers are amazing. Oftentimes, if you're using this in your work, you're gonna have tons of them, like 50 to 100 of them um, running, and you'll be scheduling them, and some of them will break because a data set changed or whatever. Um, and so this is a really great thing to test out, try with different data sets, uh, and really get familiar with it because crawlers are amazing. Let's go down here. Let's go to ETL jobs. So this is the last thing that we're going to be taking a look at in this lesson. There is, of course, more to AWS Glue, but this is kind of like the two most important things I would say. So let's go over here to a visual ETL. And what we're going to do is we're going to build out. I don't think I have an unsaved job. We're going to build out um, our very first ETL job within AWS Glue. Now, what we have here, and I'll talk a little bit more about this in a little bit, we have parent node and we have uh, the child node. I think it's node, uh, if that's the right term, but we have parent and child uh, different nodes that we have in here, and we need to make sure we chain them properly. Now, luckily we have this ETL visual tool, and that's what we're in right now, is we'll be able to see what we're doing when we're in here. Now let's come over here and let's go back to our sources because we have to have a source to start out with. So let's go to Amazon S3 and we're gonna click into this Amazon S3. So we're gonna pull data from our Amazon S3 bucket. We need to specify our location and we can either make it recursive or not recursive. And I'll explain that in just a second. Now, let's come in here. We'll go into our bucket. We'll go into our patient data. Now, let's specify just this first file here. We really don't need recursive because we don't have any sub directories. So we can turn that off or we can keep it on. We also have a data format. The, our data format is not uh, no format. We have a CSV format, which is comma separated. Now, what it's kind of prompting us to do down here, and I highly recommend doing it, is getting a data preview. So we can see the data as we're transforming it and changing it. So I am gonna come in here and I am gonna specify this role that we had created earlier. And we're gonna start this session. Now this could take just a little bit of time, but we're gonna get a data preview down right here at the bottom. And now our data preview is ready. We're looking at uh, this file right here. Next, what we're gonna do is we're gonna come over here to add a node. And we're gonna go to transform and we're going to join. Now we have to specify uh, a few things here. One, we can name this, so it's just called a join. Next, our node parent, and this is what I was talking about before with the parents. So this parent is our first data source, which is just called Amazon S3, which we could change. We can come in here, we can call this uh, patient data one. We can call this patient data one. Then we'll come down here, we can go to the join, and notice if you come in, in here, we only have one data source, so we need to specify a second data source. Let's come back out here. Let's come up. Let's go back to our sources, and we'll pull in our second one. And I'm actually going to change uh, this view really quickly. I like it going left to right, but some people like it going up to down. Um, you can just do that using this button right here, which is the direction, but I like this direction a little better. So we're going to come into this bucket. Let's call this patient data 2. And let's specify our other patient data, which is our second, which is number two, which actually says file one in it, but you know, just ignore that, okay? Um, but we are going to do that right there. We already have our preview. And now we need to go back to our join and specify these are the two things that we are joining together. Now, if we do uh, an inner join, it's not gonna work because these data sets are extremely uh, familiar. In fact, if we come in here and look at the data, there aren't any patient datas to join on or patient IDs to join on. Um, they're all unique. And so what we're gonna do is we should actually be doing a union here. Let's actually get rid of this. You know what? 
that was my mistake. Let's go to transform. Let's come down. Let's find a union. Or let me search for it. So I'm going to do a union. So we're going to do a union right here. There we go. And let's go into our union. And we're going to specify our parent nodes. We have boom and boom. That's one and two. And it's going to be working on this data preview. There we go. Let's scroll down a little bit. And now they're all in there, which is perfect. That's exactly what we want. File one and file two, which is actually file one and file two. So we are good to go. This is looking really, really good. Let's come back here and let's take a look at what comes next. So we've uh, created our sources. We had two data sources. Let me pull this over here and I can't pull this over anymore. Um, but we have our data sources. And again, you can pull this data in from anywhere. We've done one transformation. Now we can do other transformations as well. We can even write a SQL query. We can look at uh, filling in missing values if we need to. We can aggregate our data, drop duplicates. These are a lot of the different things that we looked at in Glue Data Brew. Um, and there's even more options uh, in here as well. They're kind of unique to Glue, but Lastly, what we need to do is then we need to specify our target location. Where do we actually want this data to go? And so we can put it into things like an Azure a SQL database. It could go into Snowflake. It can go into a SQL server, Postgres, MySQL, Redshift, or we can just put it back in an S3 bucket, which is by far uh, the most simplest thing you can do. We could also take this data and put it into the Glue data catalog. And so if we want to use this in Athena, we have a much you know, bigger process. And then we want to put it into uh, or query that data in Athena. We can do that. So there's a lot of different places and things that we can do. Let's just come back and put it into an S3 bucket because that is going to be the simplest thing to do. So we have our process. And there at the very end, we're going to put it into a CSV file. We don't need any type of compression here. But uh, we do have an option, data catalog update options. Let me zoom in while we're here. We have our data catalog update options. So we can create a table in the data catalog on subsequent runs, update the schema and add new partitions, or we can create a table in data catalog and on subsequent runs, keep existing schema and add new partitions. So I'm gonna click on this one right here and we'll specify our database. That's gonna be our healthcare data. Our table name, we'll call this one uh, the ETL, I'll do underscore patient underscore data. And then we'll come up here for our S3 target location. So we're going to come back. We'll just place it in the Alex the Analyst bucket. Let's go ahead and choose this. And we have a fully functioning ETL process. We took two data sets, we union them together, and then we have our output. And of course, we can see every step of the way of what we're doing here. Now, if we wanted to, because uh, we already have this full process, right? If we wanted to, what if we wanted to add in an extra part? Let's say we wanted to come in here and we wanted to transform this union. Let's do an aggregation. So we wanted to perform an aggregation on this. So let's go to aggregation. Now, this doesn't look right, right? We can't union it and then aggregate it and also send it out. Well, we can, but it doesn't really make sense for what we're doing. So what we're going to do is let's say we want a union on maybe a diagnosis and look at the average age or maybe a treatment uh, could be anything. But let's come down here. Let's click on this aggregate. What we want to do is we want to put it where this is its parent. And then for the S3, the new parent for this is going to be the aggregation. So this is correct because you can see we have this line flowing here. This part is correct. We will need to aggregate it in just a second, but we need to come up here and we need to change this parent node to the aggregate and then get rid of the union. And so now we've changed our workflow here. We've changed the ETL process. So now we need to go to aggregate. Now we're going to come over here and we need to be able to aggregate our data. So we have to uh, select the fields to group by and we have to perform our aggregation on a specific column. But when we come in here, notice all of these are string. We have string, 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 and string. And that's not correct. Uh, that's actually incorrect. What we need to do is we need to come in here and after this union, we need to add an additional step. That's going to be our change schema. And then we'll select this aggregate real quick. And we're going to put it on the change schema. There we go. So we're just adding multiple steps here, but we need to specify what our data actually is. And we can see when we make the change, what will happen. So we can keep this or we can make this an integer. The uh, name is going to be a string. The age needs to be an integer as well. We have string for both of these and then a file needs to be 
an integer. And so this is looking really, really good. Everything should be working properly. We shouldn't have any mistakes. Um, oftentimes it'll you know show all blanks if you're doing something wrong. So now we can come over here to our aggregation and we say we want to do this based off of the diagnosis. Then we come down to here. This is the um, aggregation. Which field do we want to aggregate on? It's going to be on age. And we'll just do, let's do an average. Just keeping it simple. So now this is good. And we can even take a look at this right here. So this is our data that we're going to be outputting into a CSV file. And then for our data target, we've already specified everything that we need. And of course, creating the data catalog as well. So this is ready to go. Let's go ahead and uh, let's go over to job details just really quick. We want to change this. We're going to say uh, first ETL. There we go. We can come down here and there's a few different things that you can change if you want. You can change the type of job that it's going to be. You can change the glue version, the language, the worker type, a uh, bunch of different stuff in here. But I don't recommend uh, you doing any of that if I'm being honest. The other thing while we're in here, and I'm just going to mention this, although I'm not going to show this to you uh, because this gets quite complicated. I do cover this in the AWS and Azure course on Analyst Builder, but it gets a little bit complicated in here. But this is the code that's being generated from your visual. So this visual is actually writing uh, to a .py file. Now you can get in here and change a lot of things. Um, and actually it's helpful if you want certain functionalities to get in here and change these things. But we're not going to be doing that in this lesson. I just wanted to show this to you. If you want to edit the script, you won't be able to use the visual ETL anymore because that's for kind of simpler visual things where you're doing it exactly how they have it kind of made for you. But if you want to go and start doing custom things, which you can do, and it's pretty awesome, you're just going to have to confirm this and then you won't be able to use the visual anymore. So just be warned uh, that is uh, that is something. So job has not been saved. Let's go ahead and save this. This is our first ETL. We successfully created this and now we need to run this. So let's go ahead and run this. Let's go to our run details. This process is running and we had multiple steps of our first ETL uh, job that we created. Now we're going to let it run. And then when it's done running, we'll take a look at the output. It looks like our run failed. This happens. Let's see what actually occurs. Says an error occurred when calling the .py write dynamic frame access denied. Um, so let's go back. Uh, let's go to visual. Let's go see which role we actually took, or maybe uh, that's in a different place because maybe we need to go to the IAM and give uh, different uh, different options here. And here we go. So now we have this AWS uh, glue service role. Let's come over here. Let's go in and actually look at this glue crawler role. Maybe we'll give it admin privileges uh, just for this example that you probably wouldn't do that in real life. But let's go over to uh, let's go. Let's go to the EC2 because we don't need that one. Let's go to the IAM. So let's go back to all services. It should be right over here. Yep. In the security identity compliance. Let's click into here. Let's go to our roles. And it should be this Alex glue crawler role. Let's make sure that's the right one. Alex glue crawler role. So let's go into this Alex glue crawler role. It's tough to say. Um, it is possible that we didn't have the correct access. So let's go into, I guess we're, we are getting, um, we're getting a lesson in a little bit of IAM. We're going to attach a policy to this. We're just going to give our guy straight up admin access. So we're going to say uh, admin. Now there's a bunch of different admins in here. There should be one just says admin full access. Maybe it's this one. Yeah, it's allow everything. So this is the one we're looking for. So we're just going to attach this policy to this person. I think it was an S3 uh, thing. I think we just didn't have access to the correct bucket or something. Um, I'm not 100% sure. But this is saved. It was attached to the role. Let's go and try to run this again. So let's go. Um, it's our visual. But we can just run this again. And then we'll go to runs. And hopefully... This will not fail again. If it does, we'll try to work through it, right? These things happen. This is very common. So let's go ahead and give it a go and see if this one works this time. And just like that, we figured it out. We always do. It succeeded. Um, so it's just a permission issue. And uh, believe it or not, that is extremely, extremely common. Um, so that succeeded. Let's go over here to our query editor. Let's go ahead and refresh this. We have our ETL patient data. Let's go ahead and preview this table. 
Now it's being separated by commas. It didn't, uh, doesn't look like it separated out exactly how we wanted it. Or maybe we did it wrong. Uh, I'm not sure, but it's in there. It's just not in the right format. So that's something you can definitely fix. Let's go over to our bucket. Let's go right here and refresh this. If we come down here, we have a ton of these really tiny files, like 21 bytes, uh, really, really tiny. Let's go down to the bottom. Let's unsave. Let's see what this is. We have these CSVs in here. Let me, let's go into this really quick and let's download this and let's open this up. And so this is our original data, it looks like. So this is part of the original uh, data set. This is not part of our actual output. Let's go back. If we come down here, let's take a look at any of these. This is just part of the run object. And so that is in not a file. And let's scroll down. So we're getting this really weird output. Let's actually go back. Let's go back to our visual. And so for the format, we chose CSV, which should be fine. Uh, we have compression type as none, but maybe we need a compression type. And then we were putting this in the healthcare data. And so maybe we don't want the CSV type, or maybe we need some type of compression. Maybe we need to zip this up. So let's try doing this in something like a parquet file. Really great file. Maybe we want to put in a snappy compression. Feeling wild. Um, I'm going to keep it like this just for now. Let's try it, but it looks like we need to aggregate this properly. And so let's go back in here, let's choose diagnosis. I guess it forgot what we were doing over here. We'll do age, aggregate function is average. And now that's working again. So let's go over here. Let's uh, try a parquet file. Let's save this. And then we are going to run this. Let's come over here to run details and let's let that run and see what happens. And it looks like this one failed. Let's come back over here. Looks like we may need some compression. Let's go back to our visual. Let's add snappy compression, although I'm not a fan. Let's go ahead and save this. And let's run this. And let's try again. All right, this one succeeded. Let's go down here. Let's click refresh really quick. Let's go down to our patient data. Actually, we have it right here. Let's go ahead and run again. Let's go down, still doing the same thing. Let's go to our S3 bucket. I should have cleaned this up first because now it's just going to keep getting messy. But if we scroll down, now we have all of these parquet files. Now this is still a lot better than what we had because now we can pull in these parquet files and we can join them together. And that's just kind of a typical run with an ETL job. Um, and so this is actually a lot, lot better. If we want it all in one file, Unfortunately, there is not a very easy way to do this. We can come in here and go to Amazon S3. There's not really a great way or an easy way to be able to do this. And so what you need to do is if you want it all in one file or you want it in a specific format, you have to script it out yourself. Um, again, it's not crazy hard to do once you've gotten in here and you kind of understand a little bit. But if you want to be able to do some of these custom things within using ETL, this is how you do it. Um, within the visual, it kind of limits you. So this would still be good. This type of ETL process um, would still be perfectly fine because it's just going to append all of this uh, data if you're putting it into a database or something like that. That'd be perfectly fine. And so not as clean of an output as Databrew was when we were working with these ones up here, but we are able to do different things that Databrew isn't able to do within Glue Studio. And so this is how you use it. This is how you create these ETL jobs. Sometimes you got to get in and you have to customize a little bit to get the exact output that you want or are looking for. Um, but I'm going to have to come in here. I'm going to clean this up uh, because this is a mess now. But this is how you use uh, Glue and Glue Data Brew. Once you get in here and start trying it out and messing with all this stuff, you'll understand, right? As you start using it more, this is not uncommon. This actually happens all the time and is not a bad thing if you know how to use the data correctly. Now, like I said, there is a ton more to AWS Glue than just these two things, although those are kind of uh, some of the bigger things that I wanted you to know to how to use. But there are things like workflows and triggers and things like schemas. And these are, of course, the most popular ones. So make sure to know these ones. And we covered some of them in this lesson. But Glue is very expansive and you're going to use it for a lot of different things. Now, if you're a data analyst and you're working on something like a data collection team, uh, which is something that I worked on for many years, 
then you might be getting in here and using this quite a bit. But if you're just a data analyst and you're waiting for the data engineer or database developer or whoever's you know, bringing in this data, if you're waiting for them to bring in the data, most likely you're not gonna get in here that much. You might inform them, you might say, hey, I was looking at the data, uh, the data looks bad or there was something wrong with it, so you're looking for quality issues immediately. Then you'd relay that to a data engineer and say, hey, could you go and check out that job that brought in that data? And then they would go and check it. That's typically how you know that would actually work. So just something to be aware of uh, with glue, but uh, glue, glue data brew, and glue crawlers as well as ETL, all stuff that I recommend you testing out, trying out, figuring out how it all fits together and works. With all that being said, that is the end of the lesson. If you haven't already, be sure to check out my AWS and Azure course on Analyst Builder. I go a lot more in depth into glue and everything in it. We even create some custom scripts in here to put it all in one file, which is really uh, useful to know how to do. So if you're curious about how to do that, be sure to check out that course. If you have not, be sure to like and subscribe below and I will see you you in the next video.